Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing this beautiful Sunday? Great. I love this weather. It's like a little chilly, a little warm. The sun's out. This is a beautiful day. So I'm glad to be here this morning. So uh, we're actually continuing our series on uh, new beginnings. And uh, we've uh, examined some interesting uh, stories over the last couple weeks. We talked about uh, Noah. Then we talked about Gideon last week. And we're not going to move too far from Judges this morning. We're actually just going to the next book over from Judges. We'll be in the book of Ruth this morning. So if you want to turn your copy of God's Word, and if you don't have one with you, there is one nearby. And if not, share with a friend. They'd be, lo- they'd be glad to have you. And so the book of Ruth uh, is an interesting story for a lot of reasons, but namely, uh, some theologians have, uh, have said that it's really uh, the, an additional book of Judges in the way that it actually takes place during the time of the Judges. This is pre-Kings of Israel, and so there was still a lot of activity in Israel, and they were still settling in the land of Canaan that was promised to them. And we learned a little bit last week how uh, not all of the tribes were obedient and they didn't all clear out the land as they were supposed to. And there was many uh, remnants of other cultures and civilizations that stayed that people would marry into and then ultimately become part of their culture and they would assimilate into their space. So what I want to do is actually just read chapter one real quick. It's a, it's a quick read and it uh, gives us a good backdrop for the the, the premise of our discussion today. So uh, it starts out with a famine in Judah. So it starts off in Ruth 1, 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. I always get that wrong. His wife's name, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilon, and they were uh, Ephrates from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, uh, Elimelech and Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. They, they married Moabite women, one named Oprah, I'm uh, sorry, not Oprah, that's a mistake, Orpah, and the other Ruth. That would be an interesting story. After they had lived there about 10 years, both uh, Milan and Kilion had passed away or died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband, so she was all alone. So, when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, mind you, we started out with a famine, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to me, shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we will, go, we will go back with you to your people. So they were not interested in uh, sticking and in, in going back home necessarily. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have two more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband and tonight they gave birth to two sons, I love that. Just a matter of fact. Uh, would you still wait till they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughter, it is bitter. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. So she's feeling a certain way. At this they wept again, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and said goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people, and her gods go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you leave you or to turn back from you. And here, wait for it, this is the popular phrase here. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. What an, what an oath, by the way. What an intense oath. If I ever separate from you, let the Lord deal with me severely. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. She gave up. <laughs> so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? They were pumped. They haven't seen her in a long time. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was 
beginning. So there's a lot that's happening in that brief story, but really, as it is with any story in the Old Testament, reading it in excerpts comes, becomes more confusing. So I'm going to give us a, just a, a good backdrop of our discussion. So uh, in short, we have a man from Bethlehem, right, named uh, Eli Melek names Naomi, his two sons, Malon and Kilian, both went on to live in Moab and marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. They both passed away, and they said to go back to your Moab land. And now keep in mind, they, they, they worship a, a different god in uh, Moab, and the deity was known as uh, Chemosh. And this means that Ruth was a foreign woman and not part of the covenant people of God, meaning she wasn't an insider, she was an outsider, right? And this means that Ruth was foreign and not part of the covenant people. So she could not give any more sons in her old age without a husband, to which she replies, which we know, right? She goes on to say in 1, 16 through 18, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Right? Go, we know the verse. And it's beautiful. And it's really just an, an honoring statement. Right? Naomi, at this point, has essentially had everything stripped from her. She had her husband, her two sons, and is feeling kind of you know, bitter about the whole thing. And that's why Mara, which means bitter, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit here, is why she said, just call me that. And uh, God has a funny way of um, ignoring our heart's desires and honoring what he knows is best. And we'll, we'll see what that means in a little bit here. So the entire story is really marked by, by loss and suffering, moving from home, right? Starting over. When Naomi arrives home, there appears to be a fervor amongst the people. Could this be Naomi? You have to imagine. They haven't seen her in a long time. She didn't, you know, call them or shoot them a text and say, hey, everyone's dead. I'm coming home, right? There was no pr primer for her to arrive back home. So she just shows up. And people hadn't seen her in a while, right? Because she, she is, you know, some age has, has been put on her. And so they were curious and really realized, and it's, could this be Naomi? It stands to reason that this is probably the first time they'd seen her in a while. And so the women went out until they came to Bethlehem, right? When they arrived, they said, uh, can this be Naomi, right? So they're excited. Now, has anyone ever been in the presence of people who are excited when you yourself are kind of feeling down, right? Doesn't always match real well, right? You're like, hey, how's your day going? And they just like, you know, got into a car accident and they lost their job and their, and their dog is sick. And you're like... I just don't feel like talking to anyone right now. Okay, so you see there's a mismatch, right? So uh, Naomi was feeling a certain way. She was feeling that the whole world was against her, so she wasn't interested in pleasantries or kindness or uh, far be it from her, a joyful reception because she herself was feeling no joy. Right, and so they are, they're excited to see her. Now, uh, she can't return the sentiment, right? So she actually tr attempts to abandon her name here, which, which means, her name means pleasant. So Naomi means pleasant, and insists the woman call her Mara, which means bitter. In her mind, this is a better description because she feels that God has deliberately dealt with her, uh, deliber deliberately dealt her a series of tragedies. So she's feeling very bitter about the whole thing, right? So despite the fields being filled with barley, which we learn in the, the, the last verse, or proof that God has removed his judgment of famine and blessed his people again, uh, Naomi has no hope. She's not feeling it. The loss of husband and sons weigh on any woman to a depth of which loving friends would not be able to reach. But Naomi has more reasons, reasons to mourn. She, has, she lives in an ancient patriarchal society. Right? Her late husband sold his family land when they fled to Moab. Her options are to beg, scavenge enough from the fields to prevent starvation, to become a servant, or worse. None of those are good choices for an older woman who does not have any means. In addition, with the death of her sons, she has seen the end of her husband's family line. His land is owned by another and will not go to uh, a little Malek's uh, heir, she left this region as the wife of a landowner, giving him two heirs. She returns destitute and dishonored. So she is not feeling very strongly about the blessings of the Lord right now. And so it's interesting you know, that the, the chapter both opens and closes with a reminder of the judgment of famine and the blessing of the return. And certainly this would have been consistent with the book of Judges, which we just would have finished if we're reading you know, through the, uh, the books in order. And we understand that there was about uh, 450 years. There's a theologians argue, some say it was 371 years, some say it was 400. 52, you know, so it's up in the air a little bit because the timelines are not concrete for us. But uh, Josephus has uh, opinions that put it around 450 years. He was a historian. Um 
during the time of Jesus and certainly uh, is a uh, external source of reference that's been uh, w recognized and uh, documented. Uh, but certainly uh, we can't say with precise timeline exactly how long, but we know this is right in that space where uh, they would mess up, they would ask for repentance, the Lord would forgive them, and He would bless them. And there was this series, and it was just pretty clear from the instruction that was given to them as they were getting ready to go into the land of Canaan, if you depart from my word, I'll depart from you, but if you return, I'll be quick to uh, return blessing. So this is not a surprise uh, that this is the, the cadence that they found themselves in. And so um, we can't say with precise conclusiveness that Gideon and Boaz, who we would later learn would be someone that he would, uh, that she would come into contact with, uh, may have lived it in the same time, but nowhere in the scripture does it say that they, they were. So we're not going to jump to that conclusion, but uh, we have this comparison, right? We say that in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live in the country of Moab. The last verb is a nod to uh, the famine that was lifting, right? It's beautiful. So turn from Moab, accompanying Ruth to the Moabite, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now it's interesting because the Moabites have a very sordid past and I won't get into all of that this morning. Uh, found from our dear friends uh, Lot, uh, Abraham's nephew, and their uh, lineage was uh, not great, but in any event, so that's where the Moabites have come from. So you can, you'll have to do that research in your own uh, time uh, with, with adult supervision. Genesis is rough, guys. There's a lot of intense things that happen in Genesis. But in any event, so the Moabites are a, a um, their ancestors, or their family of the Israelites, but they're not uh, in the direct line. And so uh, they had gone a certain way. They had followed uh, Chemish and, and those areas. And so uh, they, they did not have a concrete pattern of having hope in their midst, right? And when they moved to, to Moab, mostly because there was more food there, um, there wasn't a, uh, a lot of time to uh, be reinforced by their faith because they were in a separate land. Now, uh, she goes on to say, Naomi, and I, and I wanted to go back to this here, where she mentions, don't call me Naomi, she told him, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter, right? Well, that, that name does not show up again, Mara, does not show up an, another time in the entire book of Ruth, or in all the Old Testament from that point forward. Right. There's no reference to Mara as being bitter. So it was a, a fleeting anecdote that the Lord, in his way, would allow uh, the book to be written, that the name Naomi would actually appear 12 more times after that proclamation in the book of Ruth. Right? So there would be an affirmation of who Naomi was and who the Lord was going to use her to be, which was pleasant. You see... Uh, God called her by her given name because it would be thought that her line would be that, that great things would come. God knew it, but she didn't, right? But we have a God who sees us in our sadness and in our, our bitterness, our confusion, our hopelessness. And what does he affirm? Does he affirm our wandering minds or hearts? No, thank God. He affirms who we are and what our purpose is. All right, there's, no, there's no easy button here, there's a, there, but there is a path of salvation they can get us through any mire and any conflict so it's a really a beautiful thing because 12 biblically represents perfection authority completeness often often signaling the foundation of god's divine order so was it any mistake that god affirms naomi and her purpose not in her suffering right a lot of us get stuck in our suffering we just assume that that is going to be our script from that point forward we assume that we're just going to be people who are a bitter person and we're just going to be suffering or maybe we're struggling with different elements of our own identity, right? And maybe we want to uh, project a certain identity that wasn't our own or isn't the one that we were God-given. And the Lord wants us to, to know that we have a beautiful purpose in this time, even if the world would try to encourage us to think otherwise. So we learn from the next few chapters uh, that Ruth would be given... Um, uh, a field, essentially, to glean the field for leftovers, which is actually uh, scriptural. There's actually law in Leviticus that talks about, you know, letting the poor among you glean from the, the leftover of the field. So there's always going to be enough, even if you can't work, if you don't have sufficiency, if you don't have the ability, God knew that, that the poor would be among them, knew that the suffering would be among them, and he, he created a plan for them so that they wouldn't starve and be no more. 
And so we see this in uh, Ruth 2, 8 through 9 here, um, where it says something. It says, so Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. And we see this picture later on in uh, Jesus' ministry. It's a, it's a story that we all probably know. The woman at the well, uh, Jesus was uh, having a, a lovely interrogation uh, with uh, this, this poor woman who is uh, asking Jesus questions. And in the midst of it, Jesus uh, is questioned about uh, getting water. And she said, you know, he, he gives this beautiful parallel. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, referring to the water from the well. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So this is a picture of, of permanent blessing because... Um, we see that Boaz was showing kindness and he said, you know, that the jars will be filled and you'd have water available to you and they, they won't lay a hand on you. You'll be protected. You'll be okay. You'll be provided for. And I love that Jesus uses, uh, the, 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 draws again the, the, the idea of water being living, living water, the eternal life through him and from him. And I, and I love this too. And it, you know, there's a beautiful picture when he says that no one will lay a hand on you. So oftentimes we might think to ourselves that we put our faith in God that we want to experience discomfort. That's not going to be the case. So we're going to experience some discomfort from time to time. We'll experience loss. We'll experience suffering, pain, injury, um, surgeries of sorts, right? We, we experience things that are going to weigh on us. And that's not a disruption of our faith, but more a perfecting of our faith to, to lean more heavily on the Lord. So, so I love what, what Jesus says here. In John 10, 28 here, he says, uh, referring to those who he's going to keep secure, so I give them eternal life and that they shall never perish. No one will ever snatch them out of my hand. So I love that we have this opportunity in the story of Naomi to see this new beginning. It was a new opportunity. Everything was torn from her. She, she had nothing left. And God provided. He interceded. He allowed kindness. He allowed people of God to intervene and to provide for her. And in the same way, we have, we have a, a Heavenly Father who has delivered for us a, a Messiah, a Savior who desires to take us from the, the suffering of this world and deliver us into the eternal life with Him. So let's close in prayer this morning, guys. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning and for your instruction about the beautiful story of Naomi and Ruth and the story of where hope seems to be gone and frustration seems to be high and every resource seems to be depleted and yet you intervene and you provide resources and people and love and you use your people to demonstrate the kindness that you have shown us many times. We ask that we can reflect on this story this morning and think about how this applies to our own lives when we feel that all is lost and that we can't possibly go on any further and everything has been stripped from us and there's no hope in our immediate circumstances when we're the one trying to solve for it. So I pray, Lord, that you'd put a stark and a permanent reminder in our hearts that when we are absent, when we are missing, when we are without, that you are the provider, you are the perfecter of our faith, and that you will deliver us uh, from evil and from suffering, if not in this life, we know in the next. And so, Lord, I ask you help us to be people who have these truths buried in our hearts so that we would not lose hope when things are difficult, when we experience pain. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.